I'm Kelly, I'm from Migration Matters. And have you ever wondered how borders actually work? Borders can be big concrete things, but they can also be intangible, like visa requirements for entry or travel bans or long waiting periods uh, for your family member to come into the country. But do these borders, whether they're tangible or not, actually work as advertised? This is a question we asked Hein de Haas, who's a real authority on the topic. Hello. Hi, good to meet you. Hi, good to meet you. He's a sociologist at the University of Amsterdam, and he's been researching, writing, and talking about misconceptions like how borders actually work for quite a long time. We've done a really big uh, statistical study. We have collected all data we could get about migration movement over the last 50 years from a whole range of countries. And we have, for instance, statistically estimated the effect of a visa and what we saw on the average, and this is of course an average, is that visa reduces inflows by roughly the same amount as return flows. Of course this may differ from country to country, but the average effect basically means both effects cancel each other out. What you basically do is interrupt circulation. Wait, what? Circulation, inflows, outflows? What Hyde is really talking about is something quite simple. It's people crossing the border to leave the country and people crossing the border to get back into the country. That's circulation. And why this is important is because it has an impact on a very important number, net migration. Because this number does not go down in the way people would expect just because you put up a border wall. This net migration is inflow minus outflow. Border walls have an impact on these numbers because it might stop the outflow, it might also stop the inflow. Hmm. Hein's going to give us some more examples of this situation to make it a little bit more clear. Few people realized that before 1991 Moroccans didn't need a visa to go to Spain, so they would just hop on the ferry and move across the Strait of Gibraltar 15 miles to Spain, and most Moroccans did so. And to travel around, many would work in Spain, like in agriculture, for instance, or in construction. But there was no reason for them to stay, because Morocco is so close by, it's much cheaper to live there, and they tended to return to their families. In 1991, Spain introduced a visa for Moroccans. And this was, ironically enough, the start of permanent settlements of Moroccans in Spain. And now we have a diaspora uh, from Morocco in Spain of more than one million people. Part of the reason for that is that if you have to spend more money crossing borders, if you have to apply for a visa or pay a smuggler, the stakes are much higher and you're much less likely to return, particularly if you haven't got any papers, you're an undocumented migrant. So actually, sometimes borders increase the tendency to, for migrants to settle permanently against their own wishes to actually go back and forth. So border controls and visa requirements, a bit more complicated than politicians make them out to seem, right? Viktor Orban, the Prime Minister of Hungary, has said time and time again, if Europe cannot secure its external borders, Hungary has to secure its internal borders, which means close them. And to close them, they spent about 200 million euros building a big fence. In contrast, Germany declared its borders open. Wait, weren't they open already? And then they signaled that the capacity of their borders had been reached. Hmm. Borders tend to lock up people on one side of the border. And that is one of the negative consequences of, of border controls and very strict immigration rules that not many politicians think about. When you put in a border, yes, numbers of new people coming will decrease, but also numbers of people returning. And you may unwillingly push people into a permanent settlement, which is often neither the wish of governments nor the wish of migrants themselves. But they then opt to stay on the safe side of the border. And this is what we've seen over the last uh, decades. I think the guest worker example is a very good example of migrants who came temporarily, but when after the 1973 oil crisis more restrictions were gradually being put in place, many of those so-called guest workers from, from countries like Turkey and Morocco and Tunisia decided to stay and then have their families reunified. Exactly the same happened in the United States with Mexican migrants who, when border controls went up, opted to stay permanently and actually have their families reunify them. So actually reinforcing uh, migration and permanent settlement. So often those policies that have not really been thought through lead to the exact opposite result of what politicians intend to do. So here's a personal example for you. I was born in San Diego, California, which is a city of about a million and a half people on the border to Mexico. 
On the other side of that border is the city of Tijuana, about 1.7 million. When my sister was born, who's older than me, my parents had a nanny who lived in Mexico. It was possible then to live in one country and work on the other side, to actually go back and forth. After I was born in the early 90s, they built a really big wall to separate Tijuana and San Diego. This wall included checkpoints. It made it a lot harder to go back and forth. That, that wall even extends into the ocean. It's actually on the beach. And of course, people can swim around it, but the messaging is quite clear. The transit really stops here. So people get stuck behind borders, not just in front of them. But what Hein also says is that just because borders don't work as advertised doesn't mean that countries shouldn't try to control migration flows in some way. Just that maybe building a big wall or having a travel ban isn't the right way to do it all the time. But if these border walls don't work as advertised, what other options do we have? <laughs>